Hi, I'm Dr. Evan Getz. I'm the chair of Arts and Humanities at the University of St. Catherine. And I'm Dr. Zachary Porku. I'm a professor of history and theology at the University of St. Catherine. And we think as a culture, aren't, we are not prepared to have a conversation about AI. Part of the problem with AI is that we as a culture don't really know how to talk about it. And one of the main reasons that we don't is that we don't have a working definition of the person. What is a person? Now, everybody is familiar with the idea of the scientific revolution. And while we've spent the last few hundred years advancing technology in all sorts of wonderful and productive ways, we've also spent that time as part of the scientific revolution stamping out any of the conditions that we actually need to believe in persons. One way is that we've decided that there were no gods or spirits. That's from the Enlightenment. In other words, there are no non-human persons at all. This led to a new definition of the person, which is as some sort of a complicated machine, one that's ultimately reducible to chemical or biological processes. We also did the same thing with meaning. After the scientific revolution, people no longer believed that the beauty of a sunset or the sweetness of an apple or the joy of music were real properties of those things. Any ideas we have like that are just perceptions, the perceptions of individuals about those things. In other words, this leads to a universe where there is no inherent meaning in anything at all, yet a sense of meaning is vital to real intelligence. By the time we get to the modern world, therefore, we don't have any generally accepted models, either for personhood or for meaning. And that's exactly when we decide we want to start creating something like artificial persons. Dr. Getz, what are some implications of all of this? Well, without a working definition of persons, we don't really know how to distinguish persons from tools. This opens the door to persons being redefined in terms of the tools we use. Tools are never neutral. They have the power to shape our understanding of self and the world if we let them. In particular, reliance on tools has led us to believe that human activities are replaceable by machines. How did we end up without a clear definition of personhood? In traditional definitions, philosophers such as Aristotle and Thomas Aquinas believe that all humans could discover the ends or purposes for which they are made by rational reflection or revelation. In the 17th century, French philosopher and mathematician René Descartes, following a quest for certainty, abandoned the traditional views of his predecessors. Furthermore, his contemporary Thomas Hobbes recast human reason as mere calculation something that machines do quite well. With such theories reducing and limiting the scope of human reason, Descartes and Hobbes threw into doubt the long-held view that ends for which humans are made are knowable. The practical result is we no longer view human reason and subsequent action as primarily about human formation since we are unsure about human ends. All we have left is the human and the product they create, the human and the textile they weave, the human and the scientific experiment they conduct. In other words, the human is the means and the work they produce is the only purpose or end. Ends are reduced to material external outcomes. Under this view of personhood, the human is reduced to an instrumental tool. This tool view of humans is illustrated best by using a current example with a lot of relevance to AI discussion, student writing assignments. What is an essay? Well, under a tool view, it's a representation of student work. The purpose is completion or a grade. But under a person view, the purpose of the essay is to change and develop the student in person. As the student writes, they learn. They grow in insight and wisdom. The most important purpose of writing is not the essay itself, but the transformation of the person writing the essay. As a teacher, I do not view students as means to generate essays. Rather, I view the essay as the means, and the ends are to clarify thought, deepen insight, and cultivate wisdom. As a teacher, I plan a class that is not itself a product. I am not a tool to produce other tools. If I treated the classroom and lesson plan as a product, the efficiency of AI might be appealing. But I too grow through the interpersonal act of teaching. 
Some of the ends I pursue are quantifiable and measurable, but the most important are metaphysical and personal. For this reason, I cannot replace my work of creating a course or lesson with the tools of AI. To conclude, there are two things we need to clarify here. The definition of personhood and the way we slide into seeing ourselves and others as tools. The language we use inevitably reflects the way we think about ourselves. We have so thoroughly adopted computer metaphors to talk about humanity, we are programmed or hardwired, that we might not notice how strange it is to use the words artificial and intelligence together. In any discussion of intelligence, we ought to begin with human intelligence and see how the machine fails to capture the richness of human reason. Thus, the example of student, student writing assignment demonstrates that when we see human activity in terms of productive function, i.e. the essay itself is the product, then any means like AI of producing that product are acceptable. But if we view human activity in terms of an exercise of personal intelligence, which is reflexive and transformative, then the person is not a tool, but an individual being formed by an activity towards a particular end, something that cannot be outsourced to a machine. Dr. Porku, can you give us a preliminary answer about what AI actually is? Certainly. So I think the best thing we can do right now to help with the discussion of AI in every field is to define our terms so that we know exactly what it is we're talking about. So to do this, I think the most important step is to distinguish between weak AI and so-called strong AI. So weak AI is what you might call something like a calculator. It can do very specific functions very well, but it can't do others. It's specialized and therefore lacks what we would call a general intelligence. It can do some things and not others. It's easy to see how weak eye is a tool and not a person. A calculator is clearly not a person. Now, strong AI, on the other hand, is the idea that an intelligence of an intelligence that is not merely a calculating machine of one kind or another, it's actually a real intelligence, analogous to a human's intelligence. That means it has general intelligence, it can do many different things, but it has many other attributes that we take for granted in a human intelligence, such as the ability to self-correct, the ability to self-reflect, to care about certain kinds of things, and so on. In other words, it's not merely a simulation of an intelligence, it's an actual intelligence. This is the popular concept of AI that we see in science fiction. But as of right now, strong AI only exists in science fiction, and it isn't clear how we get from here to there, even though many people want to. What we have right now are what are called large language models, or LLMs, which are a kind of weak AI. How does an LLM work? It doesn't actually have general intelligence. It works by taking large sets of data, building a model for the relationships between that data, and then it makes predictions about the connections between those things. So all ChatGPT does is it takes your question and then it predicts the combination of words that you want to hear as a response. It's actually much closer to divination than you might think. All right, Dr. Getz, what are some takeaways and some questions that we should be asking? In the discussion of artificial intelligence, we should start with questions about the nature of human purpose apart from and before considering what AI can do. The machine should serve the person. What is a person exactly? Is it merely reducible to mechanistic processes? What aspects of our activities cannot be replaced by machines? And why? What role can theology, which has always had traditionally robust definition for personhood, play in our discussion about AI? Thank you, everybody, so much.